thank you very much for that. Oops, thank you very much for that uh, that wonderful introduction. Uh, and thanks everybody for joining, taking you know time out of your day to uh, to join this webinar. I hope it's valuable to you. Um, you know, we try to make this stuff as educational as possible. Um, you know, this is I think things that we live in day to day here at Cockroach Labs. And while they're important for Cockroach Database and what we're doing, hopefully they're applicable in, in what you're doing in your day to day lives and in the way you think about data in a, in a distributed environment. You know, I think, you know, the work that's happening within the Linux Foundation to kind of promote and extend, you know, the use of, of distributed systems via, you know, cloud native and the CNCF. I've been part of that for a really, really long time. Super exciting. Um, and I think, you know, the, these concepts are applicable well beyond kind of what we're doing. This is less a commercial about Cockroach Database and more a commercial about distributed systems. Or at least I hope it's that way. Uh, gosh, man, by all means, feel free to, to ping me up and chat and, and QA along the way. Um, I, like, like as stated, I'm Jim, Jim Walker. Uh, I'm principal product evangelist here at Cockroach Labs. Uh, I am, I, I, just, I don't know, I still claim to be an engineer. It's been a while since I coded anything professionally, but you know, I still mess around. Uh, you know, under, in, in an engineering undergrad, and then on Twitter, I'm just I'm James, which is the Chicago pronunciation of my name, James. So, um, this session is intermediate. Uh, this isn't beginner material. This is a little bit more complex, but it, we aren't going to get. It's not. It's not advanced. We aren't going to have like fingers on keyboard. We're going to go through some concepts. Now that said, I, I am definitely no distributed systems expert. Um, I live in this world. I'm curious about it. Um, I, I, I thrive in this. I, I think it's in, in incredibly interesting. Um, but I do believe that the, the content today and, and just kind of this distributed mindset and, and distributed concepts and distributed principles, I believe, and I'm a firm believer that this is what, what makes careers. Uh, I think this is kind of the, the, the coming of, of IT and the coming of tech uh, is distributed systems and cloud. And so what I'd like to do today is just give a high level context of, of these kind of important concepts, right? So we're going to cover the cap theorem. Uh, we're going to talk about Raft, which is a distributed consensus protocol, similar to Paxos, if you're familiar with that. And I'm going to also go through MVCC. And we're going to talk a little bit about how this kind of all comes together to provide an active active database. Now, it, Cockroach in particular is a CP database, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. You know, we, we, we err on the side of consistency. Um, but there's a lot of things that you can do in the context of the cap theorem, where if, you, if, you, if, you, if you're one type of database, you kind of have a range of abilities on the other side. And, and we're going to talk about that. Um, and as noted, um, oh gosh, please do ask questions in the QA panel. I've got a uh, um, sidecar going here on my iPad so I can see questions and I'm, I'm happy to stop along the way um, to, to drill into things or to answer any of your questions along the way. So um, with that, let's get let's get into this. So, you know, I'm a, I'm a student of history. I, 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 especially in tech, I find it to be, extremely interesting. I mean, there's kind of four kind of big moments in time, I think are really important to kind of think through and how do we get to where we're at? I think about, you know, Fairchild Semiconductor and the Treacherous 7 there. Um, the Treacherous 8, I mean, uh, these are the guys that actually started Intel. Uh, they, there was a major, huge, massive group of people who, who really innovated and, and, and to me kind of started this entire tech community uh, and, and the whole tech, ups, tech startup world. Um, I, I also like to note, you know, Xerox back in the back in the eighties, y'all. Xerox was a big player, and the Palo Alto Research Center, which is actually still going, Park Place. Uh, you know, what came out of that was uh, Windows, uh, the the mouse, um, everything that we think about in computer today. A lot of that stuff kind of started there. It, it, there was a language called Smalltalk that that's my favorite language of all time, and then digital had a huge group of people that um, you know really kind of reinvented the way we think about you know. Uh, infrastructure of, of modern chips and risk processing and these sort of things. Now, there's a big group of people that were at digital when they got sold to Compaq in the 90s that, that stuck around for a little bit, but they really kind of collapsed their R&D department. And a huge group of them went to Google. Uh, and, and there's this kind of connective tissue from, from way back in the, in the 60s and 70s all the way through to where we got to Google. And, and I bring up Google because to me, you know, the, the advent of kind of Google infrastructure for everyone else that's where we're at today. And, and the technologies that I'm going to talk about today, the, the, this theorem, uh, these principles, honestly, you know, the, the Google team has done an amazing job and a phenomenal job basically innovating and, and making all this stuff happen. And I like to start there because I think there's these two gentlemen on the, on the right hand side of the slide, um, Jeff Dean and Sanjay Gamawat. If, if you don't know who they are, I just believe that anybody who is in tech and in kind of modern distributed systems 
you need to know who these two are. If you if you look at some of the, the the papers that they've written and the research they've been involved in, from MapReduce to Big Big Table, the start of kind of NoSQL, the GFS uh, and and you know that, that kind of became Colossus, the entire backend file system of, of Google, um, Google Cloud Spanner, which is actually something we're going to talk about a little bit about today, TensorFlow. You know th these two gentlemen have their hands on just about everything, uh, and I think the modern internet and and the way we think about you know, our systems and, and our lives really have been affected by, by these two. And I, I always like to start here because you got to give kudos to some people where they started. Now, uh, if you want a good read on kind of, you know, early days of this in the 2000s and, and where kind of Google started this, like, uh, you know, I, I really building scale out internet service. I mean, if you, you know, go back in time, I mean, Google came out, it was just like, you know, it was a Google search engine where there's a little bar where you're like, what's the big difference here? Well, the big, the big difference was the way the back end worked. Uh, and so this is actually a really, really good piece of, of, uh, of research by Jeff Dean that I think is actually pretty awesome to, uh, from, a, from a point of history to kind of look through. I would go check that out. Now, just as a side note here, uh, my employers, uh, Peter, Spencer, and Ben, uh, they were at Google as well. Uh, their employee numbers are in the mid 300s. Uh, you know, uh, Peter and Spencer actually worked heavily on Google Colossus, which was the next generation of Google file system. Um, but they saw really, they had a front row picture of, of Bigtable, Megastore, Spanner, because basically a GFS and, and Google Colossus actually sat underneath these things. So lots of interaction. Uh, and then Ben, you know, worked heavily on Google Reader, you know, God bless Google Reader, RIP. Um, but really great stuff. And so, so I bring this up because, you know, Peter and Spencer left Google and they started a company, they worked in a couple of companies and they were frustrated because they didn't have like the, the scale out tools. And that was the genesis of, of Cockroach Database. I mean, that was, you know, how do you take these principles and actually allow them to be used outside of Google for lots of other people? And I think that's exactly what we're seeing with a lot of technology today. I think, you know, the, the Kubernetes space is, is a really great example of this as well. And everything we're seeing kind of this distributed systems of this next generation. So. So what is the cap theorem? Let's get into the, the topic, why we're all here, right? So the cap theorem is actually Brewer's theorem. Uh, you know, I think we, we call it the cap theorem because that's really what it's all about. But there's a gentleman by the name of Eric Brewer. And if, if you're also, again, if you kind of go back in time, you know, Eric was uh, the founder of Inktomi. And, and what Inktomi did around search in the, in the late 90s was truly phenomenal. In fact, a lot of the people that were at Inktomi ended up going to, you know, places like Hortonworks and Cloudera and kind of this, this movement towards big data, right? And so you know, this, this group of people really kind of started this, this, this concept of thinking about data and search and, and how, we, how we deal with this data in a wholly different way. And Eric, you know, as founder of this, uh, had, a, had a huge impact on this. Um, you know, fast forward, you know, until, you know, 2000s, early 2011, uh, he actually ended up joining uh, Google. Now, I bring up, I mean, Eric has been phenomenal and, and his work around the cap theorem is just awesome. Uh, this this concept first appeared in 1998, so it goes way back. Um, and and we were debating uh, the concept of acid. So atomicity you can see uh, isolation and durability within within a database versus base. And base stood for basic availability, soft state, eventually consistent. Um, and if we think about that, it sounds very much like NoSQL. So we've been talking about the concepts of NoSQL versus kind of relational databases. And what are the trade-offs? That, that's really the genesis of this. And it was the genesis of the cap theorem. Um, and, and very soon after that, you know, like the, the base principles were kind of used to kind of go forward and build a big table and some other things. Now, Eric published this, uh, it's an IEEE CS document uh, and he published it, it's called the cap principle in 1999. Uh, he presented this in 2000 um, at principles of distributed systems or principles of distributed computing conference, PODC. Uh, and that was really kind of the first time that, that the kind of world saw cap theorem. And then this thing was proven by a couple of, uh, uh, I think, researchers at MIT in 2002. So it was then proved as a theorem. So the, the genesis of this really goes back to it's Brewer's theorem, but it is the cap theorem. Now, in 2011, fast forward, Eric joined uh, Google. There's this another Wired article. It's actually a great read. Um, you know, Eric sat down very near uh, Jeff Dean and Sanjay Gemawat. And so you can start to imagine some really amazing engineering minds coming together to do some really interesting things. He's bring the, the, this concept of the, the cap theorem. And the, the, the change in infrastructure at Google around this time was tremendous. Um, they really moved towards this kind of automation of everything. And this is a big piece of it. I bring this up and, and Eric is amazing because if you read this article, he talks about, he's like, 
I didn't rewire Google. There was a whole mess of people, a whole lot of people involved in this. And so he was a big part of that team and, and really kind of a lot of thought leadership there. So if you want to learn more about distributed systems, um, I would go check out, actually, uh, if you check out the Google Scholar stuff um, that Eric Brewer has published, Jeff Teen, Sanjay Goh, you'll, you'll read some papers that are truly just amazing. I mean, think about Borg, Omega, Kubernetes, uh, Cap Theorem, uh, you know, they just, you could go through the list. Um, I think Google does a great job of publishing this stuff so that we can all read it and I'll actually all learn from it. So uh, this is where I kind of get a lot of the stuff that I learn about distributed systems. So I would highly recommend this to everybody. So, okay, great. So, all right, it's about 10 minutes. I just wanted to give a little bit of a baseline. So, so let's get into the, tech, the cap theorem. So look, the cap theorem basically states that it's impossible for some sort of distributed data system to simultaneously provide to, to simultaneously provide these three guarantees across consistency, availability, and partition tolerance. Consistency just means every read is going to return the right the, the, the right data or an error. Availability is going to um, uh, availability is going to say, yeah, I'm going to have access to the system. And then partition tolerance means in a distributed system, it can tolerate the disconnection of pieces of that system. So say it's nodes, if a network fault happens between two of them or a, no a node gets, gets, gets separated, it's gonna be able to tolerate that. And so those are the three concepts. Um, somebody's asking, can you share the scientific paper links referred to in the webinar? Absolutely, um, there's some QR codes. We'll share these, 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 uh, uh, this stuff later. So uh, I added QR code. So, so we'll definitely do that, Mohammed. So we'll, we'll definitely get that out to you. So, so let's talk about consistency. Consistency is, so if two requests are made from two different users um, against different nodes, they're going to get the same data returned. So here we have two users. They're both asking, you know, select star from customer and you're seeing two records come back. It is going to be the same no matter which node or which component of that distributed system is asked. And that's consistency. That's a really, really difficult thing to do because, well, how are you synchronizing data? How are you dealing with kind of differences? Uh, you know, if, uh, you know, can they all actually surface reads and writes? Like there's lots of different complexities here. And I think consistency is a really, really difficult problem to solve in distributed systems. Now, availability, a little bit easier, right? So if two systems, if, if requests are made against two different nodes in the distributed system, you're going to get a response. That response isn't guaranteed to be, guaranteed to be correct, right? It, you may get different answers by the two things, but you're gonna get a response. And so basically the data is available everywhere within that distributed system, right? So we have consistency, we have availability, and then there's this partition tolerant, which I kind of said, it's like, look at, if there's, if there's a disconnection between parts of the system, uh, you're still able to survive that, right? And so this guarantee is kind of special because you know, ultimately, when we look at this, you know, the cap theorem states it's impossible to have all three of these, and you can only provide two of these. Now, ultimately, the, the, the permutations here are three. There's a CA database, which is consistent and available. Now, if you aren't partition tolerant, well, then you're kind of, you're not distributed. It, it kind of detracts from the, the, the whole concept of this, right? So a CA database, a CA data system is Postgres. It's a single instance of MySQL. It's, it's a single instance of Oracle. That's CA, it's consistent, it's available on a single node, on a single like instance, right? There's not partitions of that thing, right? I guess you could kind of start talking about sharding and these sort of things, but there's lots of, lots of complexities there and, and the availability, the consistency, you have, you have issues within those things, right? So a CA database is kind of a special thing. I don't think of that as, as a distributed system because the partition tolerance thing comes into comes into play here. Where this gets interesting is when you start talking about an AP database or a CP database. And I think these are the two things that you wanna be thinking about um, for your workload and, and whatever it is you wanna accomplish with the data system, right? Uh, an AP database is gonna be available and partition tolerant. So you're gonna have access to the data set with no guarantee to getting the same response. This is Mongo, this is HBase, this is you know Cassandra, this is, uh, couch base, anything that's kind of these, these NoSQL databases, um, that's what you're gonna get. You're gonna get eventually consistent. Um, you're not gonna have guarantees on transactions and correctness of data all the time. Now these things are fantastic because you can scale out, you can get, they're really great in certain workloads, right? And so, you know, if, if you just need to basically get data to places, well, it's really fantastic option, right? Cause you're gonna survive the, 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 the a, a partition tolerance, right? And you're going to actually have the data available all the time. Consistency a little bit different. Um, you know, you're going to guarantee that every request re receives the exact same re response no matter who asks it. This is uh, Google Cloud Spanner. 
um, is really kind of the original, kind of going down this path with the CP database. And, and Cockroach database actually is, is a mirror of that, um, just kind of done everywhere else. And so CP we're gonna, we're gonna talk about, right? So if you're gonna implement consistency in a distributed environment, there's really two key concepts um, and a lot of whole lot of engineering work at the foundation of really what we're doing at Cockroach TV, but I'm gonna talk about these principles just in general. Right, so we're gonna we're gonna drive into kind of the CP thing, and we'll talk a little bit of our mount AP at, at at the end of this. So, okay, so Raft is a is a pretty important um, concept within the within the world of distributed systems. Um, this is a distributed consensus algorithm, which really allows you to provide atomic rights and consistent reads. So, what is it, an atomic right? An atomic right is basically saying, just in, as an acid in, in the acid principles, an atomic right means that basically if I'm gonna write something the atomicity of that transaction is, is complete. I'm not gonna get halfway through it or whatever. It's like, this is the transaction. And doing that in a distributed environment actually can prove tricky, right? Because, you know, a, 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 if you think about a simple select statement or uh, not a select, but, you know, like a, a fairly complex like insert or something like that into a table, you know, it seems like a simple SQL statement, right? But and the back end, the database is actually breaking that down into like, you know, four or five or 10 or 15 different like subsequent transactions uh, that are actually happening. And so, you know, it, it, do those transactions actually commit as a whole? And that's like this the concept of atomicity. Now, Raft is implemented as an odd number group of replicas of data. So basically it's like, when I write a record, I'm gonna have three copies of that and that's gonna be stored in three different spots, right? Now this is configurable. Uh, within the RAF protocol, uh, however you want to do it, it's, but it's got to be odd, right? It's got to be three, five, seven, nine, eleven, 11, whatever you want to do. And there's different reasons why you would want, you know, multiple different types of, of replica sets or size replica set. Um, RAF is a very chatty protocol. Uh, there's constant communication between, you know, these, these RAF groups um, that are happening, the, the three replicas. And then it's always keeping time via, via these kind of coalesced heartbeats, right? And so, um, you know, as a system, when you're thinking about distributed consensus and especially consistency of writing data to the database, time becomes very important because ultimately if that's what's going to give you, you know, if, if transactions are overlapping in some of this. We're, we're going to talk about that when we talk about MVCC as well. Okay, so great. Within um, Raft, there's a, there's a special group. Uh, if you think about the three, you know, the, the, if three, five, seven, there's always going to be one um, Raft leader. You know, cockroach, we call this a leaseholder, uh, if you're familiar with cockroach, but the raft leader is special. Um, it's elected by the group of three. The three replicas come together and elect this. Uh, it's going to coordinate all rights and commands to the followers. So if you're going to write something to this group, right, you want to write a record, you want to write it three times, you're going to go through the raft leader. The raft leader is going to work with the followers to commit. And as soon as two of three, so the leader and one of the followers commits, great, I have quorum write that thing. Uh, and that's that's really kind of this 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 a special nature of raft. And one of the key concepts between you know behind this distributed consensus algorithm, when you get consistency in a database that is that is distributed, using this is important. This isn't synchronous. This isn't async replication of data. I don't have like you know two systems where I'm you know writing into one and synchronizing that over to another. No, no, no. This is basically all participants coming together to ensure that you're gonna have the right data. And that's all kind of governed by Raft. Now, uh, the Raft leader is also the, the, the only person or the only the member of this can actually serve as like an authoritative up-to-date. It is always up-to-date. Now, if the Raft leader dies, um, the two followers will come together and elect a new Raft leader and create a new copy of that data as well. And so there's there's a lot more on this. Actually, I'll, hold on a second. I'll come back to that last slide. But if you go to the secret lies of data, uh, man, I don't know who did this, but it's phenomenal. It's a, it's a great description, graphical about how Raft works. So if you want a little bit more on how leaders are elected and how Raft works, um, the secret lives of data.com does a great job. And again, here's a QR code for y'all if, if you want that. Right. Um, the, the, the Raft leader also helps us with this atomic replication, right? So when I want to insert or when I want to actually do something, I'm actually talking to the Raft leader and the Raft leader is going to make sure that the right happens in each of these places in its entirety. And that's a really, really important concept because if we're gonna ask for data from this distributed system, getting the right data returned from a CP point of view is really, really critical. And so that's kind of the one of the key concepts within Raft 
um, that, are, that are really, really important to actually understand in terms of how these kind of the cap theorem gets implemented. You know, there's similar concepts in Paxos. I'm not going to get into Paxos today. Paxos is another distributed consensus algorithm um, that if you want to go check out, there's lots of information about that out there as well. Um, you know, we've implemented Raft uh, in Go. Um, our implementation is available. If anybody wants to go check it out, you know, I always contend that I think the the code base of Cockroach Database is a bit of a PhD in distributed systems. So if you wanna go check it out, you can check it out in our implementation. I know we contribute a lot upstream to etcd RAF. So if you're familiar with the etcd project, which is governed by the CNCF, um, that it too uses RAF uh, and, 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 our, and our implementation is definitely uh, contributed upstream in there. So um, so there's lots of, lots of more information about RAF and you can actually go check it out in the algorithms and all that. It, it's all online and, and, and implemented in lots of different places, right? The beauty of open source. Okay. So that's the, and then again, secret lives of data. It's awesome. So now let's talk about consistency of data when it comes to time. Um, you know, one of the biggest challenges in a, in a distributed system, when you're actually writing data into that distributed system, if you have a write coming through on two uh, services, yeah? And, and they're writing to basically the same source or they're trying to come correlate this data, the, the concept of time becomes really important because, you know, first in, first out, last in, first out, like, how, what, what are you implementing? Now, MVCC is multi-version concurrency control. Uh, we're using this to implement serializable isolation in our database. So we're going to guarantee based on time that each transaction as it comes into the system is going to be correct. And we're going to make sure that's right across every single node in the system. Now, MVC is the MVC, MVCC is described pretty well. Actually, the, the Wikipedia article on this is actually pretty, pretty well done. Uh, so if you guys want to check that out there, it's actually a pretty good read. But I'm going to try to go through this in a, you know, in, in a quick way. Again, I'm an ex-engineer. I'm just a marketer. So you know, I'm just going to leave it at that. But I, I think this does a decent job. So in this description, we kind of have three things that we're going to talk through, right? There's a transaction. There's a timestamp for that transaction. And then there's a row of data or an object that we need to write to the system, right? And those are the three concepts. That, so it's green, I guess it's orange, I don't know, I'm a little colorblind and blue, yeah? So there's three concepts. So let's just talk about a very simple transaction. So at time zero, which is up there in the top left, at time zero, I have a transaction that comes through. Maybe it's a write, maybe it's an update, I don't know, right? And I have a timestamp on that transaction as zero in the system. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, hey, object, let's write that transaction to you. So that maybe I'm updating uh, a customer named Cisneros, right? And so on, do that. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, okay, write this. And that's at time one that happened. The object says, okay, great. I, I, I update my write timestamp to one second in the system time, right? Because that, that write came through at one second. So the object has this time, he has two timestamps. He has a write timestamp and a read timestamp. What it does in the back end, it creates this kind of like temporary object, a marker, if you will, in the database, right? And it says, great, I'm, I'm, I'm not done, but I'm in kind of this half completed state. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna write this data to that thing, right? And I've been successful, right? And so I, I went through, I did this and I'm successful. So at time three, it says, okay, great. My read timestamp is going to be updated to three seconds because I have committed this in the back end and my read timestamp is three. I'm going to set an acknowledgement back and that transaction has, 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 has executed and it's successful. So at the end of this, we, we're looking at three timestamps, right? The transaction, its initial timestamp was at zero. The write timestamp, when it came into the object, was at one and it took two seconds for that thing to actually commit and go to read. Okay, and so I kind of have these two timestamps. And this two timestamps is actually re is really, really what's interesting here. So, so let's try it again, but with a conflict. And you'll start to see how this works, right? So, okay, great. So at, at one second, I come in, my right timestamp goes to one, right? It's on the right-hand side there. I'm gonna create this temp object, I'm at time two. And then wait a second, at time three, before I've actually committed this, before I'm done actually committing this in the backend object, another transaction happens against the same object with a timestamp of two seconds. So what happens is the, the timestamps are compared. So this transaction has a timestamp of two, but wait, my, my read timestamp is zero. So if I'm gonna try to, if I'm gonna write this data, I'm out of, I'm actually, I'm not writing to the most recent stuff because my read timestamp is off. 
right? Because my, my transactional timestamp is greater than that read. It's like, wait a second, we have a problem. And so typically what happens here is you get a, a, a transaction retry. Uh, so you need try catch blocks around these things so that you're actually gonna, you know, if, if an error is gonna return. But this is really the magic of this. It's, it's this concept of kind of having temporary objects and these two timestamps so that you can actually start to compare these things and you start to understand, you know, when and where these things are gonna happen, right? And so, um, so long story short, basically each transaction is gonna happen like you're standing in line at a store. I can't complete one transaction until the last one is done against one of these objects. Now it's pretty crazy when you start to coalesce across, you know, multiple different rows and multiple different objects, but this is all governed and maintained by MVCC. Now, when I first understood MVCC, it's pretty cool actually. Um, and this is the, the most simple description that I could do for this. I hope it, it, it describes it, but um, actually, so there's a question in the chat. How does MVCC compare to Google's true time? Is it complementary to it? You know, I don't know the exact details of how true time works. Um, you know, I know within Google Cloud Spanner, they're using atomic clocks to actually establish time across all these various different components. Um, you know, we're using, you know, uh, in Cogridge, actually, we're using uh, like NTP with some logical drift behind that. Um, there is a blog post that we wrote called Living Without Atomic Clocks. I think that's the name of it. If you, if you search Cockroach Labs and Living Without Atomic Clocks, uh, there's a great blog post that gets into that information. Um, I'm sorry, Ashish, I can't give you exact uh, com uh, comparison to Google True, True Time. I don't know it well enough, but uh, maybe that's a good topic. I'll I'll reach out to my friends at Google. Maybe we have a maybe we have a, a talk off on that thing. I mean, maybe it might be a really good session. So um, sorry about that. Okay, so that so that's basically MVCC. I, I, okay, my my caveat. I'm also just the marketing guy. So you know this. I think it's a, does it decent. Now there's a lot of complexity in code to actually get this done, and the the complexity of transactions uh, in a in a distributed system are pretty complex. And and I I think if if transactions and, and this sort of stuff was easy, uh, there'd be a lot of systems doing it. I think there's a lot of algorithms that you can use in your lives to actually you know, simplify these things. So how does this apply to your services and what you're actually trying to apply? How do you take these concepts and work it into the stuff that you're actually already working on? And I think that's why, you know, cap theorem is important to understand, but like, you know, raft and, and MVCC as, as, you know, just algorithms, I think are pretty awesome. So, okay, so that's consistency. Uh, Raft and MVC are critical components in understanding that. That's how we're actually guarantee the same data across every different node. But let's talk a little bit about um, availability and, and storage and Raft are actually critical concepts underneath this. So availability in the old world, uh, you know, when we had kind of, you know, the legacy database, right, is kind of has this active passive backup system, right? You, you dealt with the synchronization, right? Like uh, from the primary system to, to the secondary, you know, a write would come in, I right by primary and then, you know, there's some synchronization with some backend secondary. That's not distributed consensus. That's just basically synchronization. Now, this is costly. Uh, you have two big machines, two big databases. The synchronization sometimes is out of sync. These things go down. Uh, what happens when one goes off and one comes on? You know, how long does it take to do the failover? What happens when things come back online? How do you remediate the differences between a primary and secondary? I think there's some interesting things going on in this world um, in terms of active passive systems. Like the concept of having you know shared storage underneath you know a primary or secondary database um, that's kind of interesting, um, but still has issues. And and the concepts of raft and distributed consensus actually get get really interesting in this world because we're not doing this synchronization, we're actually writing uh, in in consensus. And, and that that using raft from that point of view is a is a key piece of kind of this availability world. Um, but we also kind of need to survive regional failures, uh, people typically synchronizing from one data center to a wholly other so they can actually survive that as well, right? So in an active, active database, we're, we're building on these kind of core concepts, right? We're building on Raft, right? Um, in an active, active uh, database is a cluster of physical nodes. Every node can accept reads and writes, which is actually a pretty important point here. Um, if you're going to be active, active, and the database is going to be, you know, is going to be implemented as, as a series of different nodes, can every single node accept both reads and writes? That's a big question because if we talk about scale, you're talking about the availability of something. Um, if you have a single write node as some, some kind of larger scale database, they have a single write node. If that thing goes down, well, your availability goes out the window because you can't write, right? So Sagwin has a single write node is actually a, a big problem. I think something that has to be addressed and you're gonna be truly active, active. It's reads and writes across every node. And 
every endpoint can access the entirety of the data underneath. Uh, this, this approach actually eliminates the whole concept of synchronization, um, but it, you're gonna have to span more than two data centers. You actually wanna do this in three, right? Because this distributed consensus thing, this replica of three, actually overlays right across you know, multiple different regions, right? And so there's, there's lots of challenges in this, but active-active kind of relational databases are, are special. There's a couple of them out there. And that really is kind of this concept behind uh, distributed SQL and this emergence of, of a couple of new databases in this. So if I think about this, 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 days, you know, this, this availability, uh, we're using Rafter. Um, basically what we're doing is we're gonna write data. Let's just take this table, there's a bunch of German records here. We have four records. We're going to write them across, you know, a, a distributed system of six different partitions, but we're going to write one across three different partitions. So the Mueller record gets written across three different things. And, and we're using Raft, this replica set, to make sure that they're across three different physical locations, right? Because now if, 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 if one of the nodes come down, I still have access to the data somewhere else within the system, and that's availability. Uh, and so Raft is used in this concept as well. And it's a critical piece of, of what we're doing. The other thing that's really beautiful, and I talked about this, every node is a gateway. So if I'm gonna select data, uh, you know, down there, user one is actually asking for the Mueller record. It's not on the node that they asked, but you'll get it from the Raft leader, which is located in the middle and the top there. The same thing on the right-hand side for say Wagner. Um, and so, you know, it's kind of one of these concepts, right? You don't need to know where the data resides, but it's always available. And it's a, another kind of critical concept. But you can also survive regional failures. You know, we have, you know, a piece of data written in three different regions. When a, you know, when a region goes down, uh, your load balancer just switches over to another region and you start accessing that data. You're always going to be surviving these, these you know, the failure of a zone or a region or whatever it is you want to, whatever your failure domain is, right? It's like kind of one of these big things around um, availability. So. Um, so there's a question that came in, Raft happens to have a single leader, every write goes through it, but in active activities, every node has to accept writes and reads. How does Raft fit in here? Great question, Big Bob. So, so in this concept of, you know, we were talking about Raft and how we're, how we're, you know, we can access the data and there's a Raft leader. Um, in, in, in this next slide, what we did is we asked one node for the data. Now the system itself uh, knows where to find the Raft leader. Right? You don't have to go to the node where the raft leader lives. Every node is an endpoint and the, basically the system coordinates so that every node knows where to go to get that data. Right? So you don't have to go to the, to the raft leader. Um, you, could, you just coordinate with it. So in this case, I'm selecting Mueller. User one is going to this, 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 this node in the bottom left. That node on the bottom left doesn't hold that data. It knows where to find the raft leader, which is in the top middle and go to get that. So it communicates. It, it communicates within, within all the different partitions and nodes within the database to go find that information. So as a user, you don't care. And the beauty of this is you just, you know, you set up connection pool and you have a load balancer in front of all this um, and, and users are connecting to any node within the, within the entirety of the database and they just find the data. Uh, and it just doesn't, you don't have to actually, you know, direct things anywhere. The, the system itself, sorts that out for you. So I hope that that actually helps you there. Um, but it really comes down to identifying where the RAF leader is within the physical uh, location of all that data. And that's, you're always going through the RAF leader to actually get that. Okay. All right. So, uh, da, 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 yep. So when a region comes back online, you just simply redistribute the data and, and nothing was lost. So in the, in the context of uh, you know, what we're doing at Cockroach has, we wanna make this as simple as possible. So this is a little bit about us here. And I was using our logo through these, but you know, ultimately when you, when you deploy an instance of Cockroach database, uh, you're, you're defining a node or a partition, if you will, within a region or within the AZ, you're giving it a location. Uh, and, and we basically have built in DML to allow you to basically survive the failure of a region or an AZ or whatever it is that you want to do. And, and we've really struck this down into, you know, some simple kind of DML commands. You would check out our documentation. I'm not going to get too deep into this, but, but we can survive things by, by row, by each table, the entirety of the database. Um, I think our documentation does a great job here. So if you want to learn more about Cockroach Database, gosh, by all means, go, go, go check out our docs, use Cockroach DB serverless, whatever, right? Um, all right, so Raft, again, distributed consensus algorithm, go check out Secret Lives of Data. I can't give them enough cred. Uh, and then availability is using kind of the, the underlying concepts of storage and Raft to actually do this, okay? So 
Um, that's kind of a quick tour of Cap Theorem, Raft, MVCC. Again, um, Cap Theorem is just saying it's impossible to have all three of these. You can only provide two. Now, I think it's actually pretty important to understand, even in an AP database or a CP database, there's ranges. Look, I'm not saying Mongo is bad. I'm not saying HBase or any of these NoSQL databases are bad. I'm saying that, you know, for certain workloads, uh, certain things are better. You know, it, you know, if I'm evaluating things, you know, do I want to code against the document model versus the relational model? It's a big question. You know, does it matter if data is always correct or not? Do I matter if I have eventual consistency versus you know serializable isolation? These are trade-offs that that you have to go through for your workload. And choosing the right database is actually pretty important in those context, in that context. Um, and so, you know, you know, to me, I, I think cockroach fits a lot of different things. You know, I think you know a NoSQL choice probably makes sense in some workloads as well. Um, but it's important to understand, especially in distributed systems, the trade-offs between these two types of systems because that's where you're going to actually run into run into troubles in your applications. I think you know the value of the cap theorem is, is understanding those things. Okay. And so that's why I think the cap theorem is actually pretty important. Now, we have conversations about this all the time. I'm happy to talk to anybody about it, you know, engage with us. We have a, uh, a community Slack channel that, you know, we have lots of people who, who actually have coded this stuff who are engaged there. You have you know, direct access to the engineers. Um, if you want to try these things, you can use it in CockroachDB. Uh, CockroachDB dedicated is a dedicated instance running, you know, we, we, it's a managed service that you just started up at, at cockroachlabs.com. And uh, we actually have CockroachDB serverless, which actually delivers this right now, single region, but a completely serverless database, uh, free to certain limits, five gigabits of storage, uh, and a decent sized application, something called 250 million RUs, request units. But you're able to actually build on Cockroach as a, as a database for free uh, as a managed service. And so we're just, you know, if you want to go check it out, you please do that. You know, for us, this is about making all this very easy. We want to give developers the relational model. We want to make sure they have serializable isolation. We want to scale out rights, not just within a single data center, but beyond many. Uh, and make that really simple inside a single data center as well. We want to automate scale so you never have to shard a database again. We want to automate operations so you don't have to worry about ongoing management of these things and, and setting up kind of active passive. We want to eliminate downtime. And we've gotten a long way to do that. And then ultimately, you know, delivering all these things as kind of a, a cloud database solution. So. Uh, if you want to go check out these things, uh, please do go check out cockroach, cockroachlabs.com, cockroach database. Um, and that is all of the content. I answered the questions that I had along the way. Um, but if there's any other questions, I'm happy to take them. Um, I hope this was uh, was valuable to you all. Um, you know, I, I enjoy pre I, I enjoy learning about these things. I enjoy certainly presenting on them um, and engaging with the community. So again, if if you want to engage with us any deeper, uh, we're happy to go through these things. So. Uh, one more question came through. Can we integrate other open source code solution available in GitHub with CockroachDB? Um, I, I'm not sure what, what, what other kind of code solutions you might want to actually integrate. Um, but I mean, there's lots of different things we do within, within Cockroach database to allow you to integrate uh, via API and, and lots of different other ways. So, you know, I'm going to presume there's, there's lots of other open source code solutions that will integrate with, with Cockroach. I mean, Look, we're wire compatible with Postgres. So if I think about you know the tools and the, the things that we use within the kind of Postgres ecosystem, a lot of them are just going to work um, on CockroachDB, which is which is actually um, pretty beautiful. And and we're pretty we're pretty open about ourselves as well. Again, the, the code base is available on GitHub if you wanted to go check it out. Um, and and like I said, kind of a PhD in 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 distributed systems. Um, there was another question. Can you please elaborate on time in MVCC? Yeah, I'll try. I, I'm, not, I'm not sure where to go with this, Fahad, but I, I'll try. I think time when you're trying to coordinate things is really important to have right across the different components of the system. And, and, and there's things like true time. There's atomic clocks, which are in, in spanner, which allow you to synchronize time across, you know, Two different things like so Fahad, if, if you look at the time on your clock at your house right now and i'm going to look at this one over here they're going to be off by at least maybe four or five seconds i mean on average right i mean geez i mean maybe our phones are pretty close but even those are off a little bit sometimes right and so getting the concept of time very very right when you're doing these distributed transactions is incredibly important um because that's really what allows you to kind of get this 
the, the serializable part of isolation, that the, the ordering, correct. And so you can use hardware, which is atomic clocks. You can use true time. I think there's a couple of the cloud providers have that sort of thing. So if you're looking at that across your services, you may want to check out true time. Um, we've implemented it ourselves within CockroachDB again, you know, living without atomic clocks, we actually outlined how we did that. So time is a really, really important piece of, um, of, of MVCC for sure, because that is, that's the timestamp. It's a critical piece of that, so. Um, let's see, uh, there was another note. Um, I was reading this about the cap theorem. Yeah, so actually this, this article, 12 years later, how the rules have changed about the cap theorem. Uh, this is an anonymous attendee and dumped this into the, into the you know, actually, I'm gonna copy and paste this over to the chat. Yep, there was, I don't know if, I don't, I don't know if they can go out to everybody. Maybe the Linux Foundation people can help. There's an article in InfoQ um, and it's called, if you type in 12 years later, how the rules have changed for um, Cap Theorem. That's actually written by Eric Brewer, a phenomenal read. I, I would go check it out. And he, he, he investigates basically the, the trade-offs between CNA and, and, and kind of like CP versus AP and how the, 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 the one that's left out is a range um, and I think that's the best way of thinking about these things. So great read. So whoever dumped that into the QA, thank you. Cause that's a, that's a great article. Um, another anonymous, anonymous attendee, would you please mention the target workload types for cockroach database? Um, you know, that's a, it's a great question. It's, it's self-serving for me. I'm happy to talk about this, but you know, workloads on top of cockroach anywhere you would use Postgres. Really, literally. I mean, any anywhere you would want to use, like in a single region, lots of value. Like you don't have to worry about scale. You just throw a node at the database and it scales. You don't have to worry about sharding anymore, right? Like it's getting rid of that concept. Um, this concept of resiliency and having that built into the system. This is a distributed system concept. It's really, really important. Like you don't have to worry about active, passive setup. Just those two things alone, just removing the operational complexity around those in a single data center, hugely, hugely valuable, right? Like the thinking about cockroach in, in a single data is great, but like it also allows you to expand to multiple regions and across the globe. So the concept of global scale actually becomes really important too. So I always think of like simple applications in a, in a data center, but if you wanna grow it to be global as well, also a, a great workload. And, and, and finally, I think, you know, your comfort with the document model versus the relational model sometimes has a has a, has input into you know the workload and what you're actually working on you know i mean you know like doing online schema changes having referential integrity doing joins you know secondary indexes you know from a data point of view i find those things to be pretty important but then again i was indoctrinated into sql long you know when i was an engineer so i think it's you know what's right for your workload is really going to drive what the type of database that that you're going to go and implement i mean from a pure relational cloud database you know I, I'm a homer, but I'm just going to say cockroach database. Uh, so it's really kind of between, you know, relational versus kind of no SQL. And it comes down to basically your, your level of comfort with consistency and your, your comfort with, with document, document model versus relational in terms of the trade-offs of, of those two things. I think that's how I, that's how I think about those two things. So, so it's really up to your workload and, and what you want to accomplish and what, what your goals and your team is, is comfortable with. So. Um, well, cool. There's no more questions. We are at 45 minutes past the hour. I think I'm about right on time. So um, with that, I just, I sincerely, I wanted to thank everybody for joining. I know it, it takes a lot to, to take time out of your day to join this. I, I thoroughly enjoy um, talking about this stuff. I hope you're all interested in it. You go research and check out some of these things. Um, I find that to be compelling. And, and most of all, I really hope this was valuable. Um, you know, if there's any feedback, please do. You know, find us on Twitter, find me on Twitter. I'm just James, uh, join our Slack channel, um, any, any of those things. So um, thank you everybody again for, for joining and have a great day. Yeah, thank you so much to Jim for his time today. And thank you to all the participants who joined us. As a reminder, this recording will be on the Linux Foundation YouTube page later today. We hope you're able to join us for future webinars. Have a wonderful day.